Hello and welcome to the Untranslatable Podcast. We are here recording episode 140, the big 140. And today we are going to be talking about American influence around the world and other countries' spin on what they think is American. So we'll be talking about some examples of some favorite American things around the world and also discuss why, why is it that you can see different American things wherever you go or almost wherever you go. There might be a few places you might not be able to find it. And my fellow philosopher, my partner in crime, my good buddy, Jared. What's going on, Jared? Hello. It's hard being popular, you know? It's hard <laughs> <laughs> being the coolest people on the block, setting the cultural trends. It's tough, and it's a big responsibility. I just want everyone to know we do recognize that. And we take it very seriously, especially Chad. He gets paid. Yes, he gets paid to be a teacher, but he also gets paid millions of dollars by the United United States government to be an ambassador. (laughs) (laughs) He takes this very seriously as well. Um, And we thank the we thank the taxpayers for uh, paying for this podcast. But all we ask spread a little love. You please just follow us on Instagram on Translatable Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter on Translatable One. The number one, you can see me post stuff like uh, um, retweeting things. Like I'll get to something I retweeted in a second. Actually, you can also see the uh, episodes being posted on all the various places that the episode shows up, which is everywhere that you could imagine. Trying to find a podcast medium, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, uh, Spotify, Podbean, <laughs> and you give us five star reviews. Spread a little love. Um, so I was looking on the internet the other day, and I noticed that another record has already been broken. Remember I mentioned the world's longest flight? Uh-huh. Well, it's being how long is the, Okay, how long is it? New York to Sydney, a guinea pig flight, is uh, being done right now. And uh, it's 19 hours and 16 minutes. But granted, it's not filled, just to be clear. Okay. So um, it's not like maximum capacity. Let's put it that way. Purpose was the purpose was to research how the world's longest potential commercial plane journey would impact pilots, crew, and passengers. The sixteen thousand two hundred kilometer test flight took nineteen hours and sixteen minutes. The longest nonstop passenger flight touched down in Australia Sunday morning after more than nineteen hours in the air. A milestone journey from New York that Qantas hopes to parlay into commercial success. And they talk about the plane they used, a 7-8 uh, fancy big plane. Um, and here, I want to get into what they did here, because there's, there's more I want to talk about. Just 49 people traveled on the Boeing 787-9 to minimize the weight on board and gave the plane sufficient fuel range to travel more than 10,066 miles without refueling. This is the first of three test flights that's going to come up with recommendations about how we manage pilot fatigue and how we actually manage pilot j- uh, passenger jet lag, uh, he told reporters after arriving in Sydney. After 19 hours on the flight, I think we've gotten this right. I feel like we've been on a flight a lot shorter than that. Qantas partnered with two Australian universities to monitor how jet lag affected the health of passengers and crew members as they crossed multiple time zones. After boarding the flight, passengers set their watches to Sydney time and were kept awake until night fell in eastern Australia with lighting, exercise, caffeine, and a spicy meal. Six hours later... spicy meals keep you awake longer? Six true? hours later, I don't know, dude. <laughs> well, I guess so. I guess that would kind of make sense. That kind of makes sense. It at least okay. makes you have to, you know, use the bathroom. Six <laughs> hours later, they were served a high carbohydrate, me- a high a high carbohydrate meal, told to avoid mm-hmm. screens, and the lights were dimmed to encourage them to sleep throughout the night. Professor Marie Carroll, a researcher from Sydney who conducted the experiment, said that she expected the innovative approach would result in absolute minimal jet lag. I, um, so not only is it just like, it, like it, there's, this, this, there's a lot to this, but it's, 
It's um, I, I respect that the the amount of effort they actually put into this. They're like, listen, we don't want any shenanigans happen up in this area as much as anyone else does. So we're trying to make sure that this is maximum comfort for everyone. I, w- yeah. I just wonder, like, what are they going to do? Like, they're going to be like, all right, if you take this flight, just so you know, there will be light exercises you have to do. Uh, <laughs> we will not. We, you, you, you do have to set your clocks. We will go around. Forget turning off your iPads. We're going to look at everyone's clock and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What time zone is that? Is that to- no, no, no. That's Tokyo. Australia <laughs> right now. <laughs> we don't need That's any crazy, though. incidents in the air. I also can't imagine being a pilot for a 19, what was it, 19 hours and 16 minutes? Yeah. And yeah, not That's fully crazy. full, though. I wonder. Um, That's crazy. I, I bet you they have at least like two full sets of uh, crew. Of pilots? Pro- yeah. I, I would think so, yeah. Because yeah, that, um, me. That, that does seem like a. I'm, that, that, I actually, that probably. Um, now I don't know what I'm talking about. I just realized, but I wonder <laughs> if it has anything to do with their time, like how much time they're allowed to fly for. Also, yeah, I don't know what those laws are. That's a good question. Because I know there like, are know like truckers, limits, to, right? Because truckers are only allowed to drive certain amount of hours. So you right. think it might be similar with pilots? There but are the there definitely time, are pilots, rules to that. I just don't know what they are. Right, right. Me either. Me either. Well, if you do, if any of our listeners know the rules, let us know on translatablepodcast at gmail dot com. Have you um, never been that's on crazy a, though? Have you never been on what? like a delayed air, like a delayed flight, and then they say we have to turn the plane around because, uh, like, they're waiting on the runway or something, and they say we have to turn the plane around because our crews uh, reach their hours, and so they mm-hmm. they they're no yeah oh yeah that's that's uh that's no fun. Oh, that, I'll bet that sounds terrible. Yeah, it's pretty wild though. I think you can go just straight from New York to Sydney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, I'm envisioning the journey in my head, and it just seems so crazy. I mean, you gotta imagine though, like in like the what, 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 whether it be Airbus or Boeing offices, like that, like that's what they're they they have that on their what you know corporate vision board. Like we need to be able to go to across this entire uh, Earth in one flight like we need to be able to go anywhere in one flight like no more no more like too too far for only one plane kind of thing i'm sure that's right. just like on their little corporate vision board would make sense i mean we're definitely getting there technology wise so it makes yeah. sense yeah yeah now it's just a matter of I would how do the it. humans I'm respond down. to the technology i would do it you know before i was well, I, you, when i brought up the other on one before guinea pig flight Mm-hmm. When I brought up the other one before, no, 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 they get they, uh, no, 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 no. I'm I once all the science has been done and it's been approved by uh, many different government and scientific agencies for flight commercially, then I'm down. Let's just be clear. I'm not Jared's down for the, the test Sydney runs. People. <laughs> I want to go to Sydney. The- Hey, check oh. out the 2020 untranslatable on the road again in Sydney. You know what? I take everything back that I just said. If Boeing wants to hit us up, and maybe we can do some podcast on those flights, talk about what it's like to be on a 19-hour flight, talk about what we That'd do, you cool. know, talk do some on the road again in Sydney. I think we can make That's this work. Sweet. Boeing, you That's know true. our email address and our Instagram. <laughs> Get Hi, I'm John Boeing. Boeing. That's for sure. <laughs> you drive a hard bargain. So, Jared, I wanted to mention, uh, you know, a couple, a couple of these episodes, I've given you some observations that I've been making while I've been in China. Right? Yes. And I have a few new ones for you. Oh, okay. And I, and I think you'll like these. I think you'll like these. So, on the last episode, I mentioned that, like, I love the, the look of China at night, right? Like, mm-hmm. there's just so many, like, illuminated buildings, and they're always different colors, and it's really pretty. Another thing, though, that is really interesting at night, at night, you will see people bring out carts with, uh, they're selling fruit, they're selling popcorn, they're selling all these different foods. Now, I haven't bought any food from them yet, but from what I've heard, the fruit is usually safe. I'm not sure about the popcorn, plus it smells like like kettle corn, like sweet popcorn. I'm a a salty popcorn kind of guy myself. That's the American in me. Um, I'm more of a salty popcorn get, person too. Yeah, get that sweet stuff away from me. 
I'm surprised, that, but there's nothing people. wrong. I'm surprised that there'd be something wrong with the. I feel like there's more of a chance that there's something wrong with the fruit than there would be the popcorn. Well, I mean, the or fruit, something you just dangerous, wash it. not wrong. Well, you you just wash it, um, okay, and, and peel it if you can peel it. But the interesting thing is, like, I wonder, like, why do they only come out at night? Like, is it? I don't know if it's legal or not. I don't know what the laws are here, and. I'm wondering, like, are these people farmers or do these people just go to the grocery store, buy fruit mm. and then sell it at a slightly higher price? And I have no I have no, no answers to these questions. Yeah. But I'm just it's curious. odd that they only come out at night, too. Like, why? Like, like uh, OK. Hmm. One yeah. day you're going to have to experiment for us. Just uh, okay. live a little, you know. Well, and the interesting thing is, too, is not only are these stands fruit and popcorn, I've seen a couple uh, chicken feet stands as well, um, hmm. so you can get the chicken feet. Which do is you just like eat the whole chicken foot? China. I don't know. I really don't know how that works because <laughs> like there's bones in there, right? So yeah, I really don't know. I haven't had it yet. Some of my <laughs> colleagues who have been here for a couple of years have told me like it's really good. Um, but and how do you eat it? I d- mm, don't know. I haven't <laughs> haven't been that adventurous with my eating here lately. Um, uh, we're gonna have to get an answer is, I, to I've, that at some point. Oh God! All right, I'm not gonna be happy about it, but I'll I'll do it for you and I'll of do it for not. our listeners, Jared. Um, but yeah, the other thing is, it was funny. I was talking to a couple teachers when I was in uh, Xi'an over the weekend. Uh, check out our previous episode for more information on that episode 139. But uh, I was talking to some of the other teachers and I told them, you know, oh yeah, I live in Jinan and Shandong. He said, oh, you have some delicacies there that are like seafood. And Jared knows, but I'm mm. not a huge seafood guy. And I told him that. And, and it's weird. Like, I feel like Chinese people don't, they don't understand that people have different tastes. Because I tell them, yeah, I don't really like seafood. And they're like, they're like oh, that's a shame. Like, you really need to, maybe I just need to open my mind more towards seafood. I don't know. But they're like, you need to really open your mind and like, uh, not open your mind. Like, they, what they say is, why don't you like it? It's delicious. And it's like, what's delicious to one person, at least hmm. in my opinion, what's delicious to one person is not always delicious to another person. Sure. It's like course. a lot of the fish have, have bones in them. So you have to like be really careful when you eat them. Um, and <laughs> sorry, I don't so really yeah, but it's, <laughs> you're, you're good. Um, but to me, it's just really funny that like, I always get asked like why, why I don't like seafood. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I don't know if I should just lie and be like I'm allergic. Like what? Because when I say I just don't like the taste, then their their retort is always, "But it's delicious." And then I'm like, I don't know what you want me to tell you at this point. I do think that that uh, as Americans, we are in general, I think more. I, I, I'm. This is just a assumption based off of almost close to literally nothing that we're more <laughs> of like a picky. B- g- we're more of a picky culture in general, I would say. It just feels like that. it just feels like to me, um, we like we're just more uh, set in on what we eat and uh, less likely to mm-hmm. try things. I would agree with that, and I also think we're very accustomed to like this is how it is, this is how it's not. Like when when mm-hmm. I go places mm-hmm. in China, and if I get any dishes with chicken in it. I get all sorts of like different parts of the meat and the cartilage. I'm not used to, you know, I'm used to like drums and chicken breast and like, like that's what the parts of the chicken we eat in the States. Right. Whereas here you get all sorts of, you get basically almost every part of the chicken. Um, plus you get it with like the skin still on it. I'm so used to like skinless chicken breast, you know, that like you just like popping a frying pan or whatever. Um, and so it's very, it's very different here. It's very, very different. Um, but I think they're a lot less wasteful in China. You know, they eat everything. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not that's your thing is another question, but that comes right. down more to like taste and your culture and what you're used to. But yeah. Um, yeah. But I just thought that was interesting that the, the people with the food carts come out at night. Um, and here it gets dark pretty early. It gets dark around five or five thirty, usually about five thirty. What's the weather like these days? The um, it's a bit cooler. I got my flannel on. It's been in the, it's been in the like low sixties, high fifties. Um, okay. It's been a little bit rainy as well. Um, but yeah. Oh, did I, I don't know if I mentioned, 
Um, I went to the Silk Market in Beijing, which is like a like a place where you can buy knockoff stuff and you can haggle. And I Ooh. went with Annabelle. Did I mention this? I don't, I don't think, think I mentioned is. this. Okay. Well, well, Jared, it's story time. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so I went to the Silk Market with Annabelle. And what, what's I Silk a Market? Why is it called Silk the Market? S- the silk is it just market, a play off the so, Silk Road kind of thing? Well, so what Annabelle and I thought was we thought it would be like an open air market with like like you go outside and there are like you know like stands and you bargain with people, right? Because there, that's where you get the knockoff Gucci, the knockoff Rolex, knockoff what? Tailored suits, knockoff Gucci, knockoff Rolex, oh, Gucci, like a fake Rolex, oh. yeah, Gucci, knockoff Versace, all all sorts of knockoff stuff, right? Well, we went in there. And Annabelle was, uh, we, we decided we were, it was, so it turns out it's not an open air market. It's like, it looks like a mall, like a shopping mall, mm. it's six, six floors high. So it's pretty, pretty big. And we went in there and then when we came in, we were just overwhelmed because there were so many different stores. So we we're like, all right, we're going to just go all the way to the top floor and work our way down, which I'm glad we did that. Smart For some move. reason, it seems like it's easier going down than going up. Yeah, because then you can just walk right out. Like when you're done, if you right. go up, you then you have to go back down. It's just That's easier to true. go all the way up and then walk right out when you're done. That's true. So so we go in there. We spent a couple hours in there, and uh, damn, a couple so, hours. Yeah. So Annabelle wanted some cashmere scarves for herself and some gifts for friends. And I tell you what, man, Annabelle is an amazing haggler. And she's also really sweet and like kind and charismatic. Yeah. So like for her, she, she knows how to work with people like she she knows. And so it was just so funny watching her haggle with this Chinese woman on the cashmere scarves because she was like, oh, if I get if I get this many pieces, how low will you offer me the price? And the woman at first, it was really funny. The woman was like offered her her a price. And Annabelle was like, like, come on. Like you really? That's the price you're gonna give me? <laughs> and so I got to I got to watch her in action. Brilliant! And I have never really haggled before. She has haggled, and she's been to over seventy countries. So she's mm-hmm. been to plenty of places where you have to haggle, right? And you know they see they see us as foreigners, and they see a they see price tag. You know oh, they yeah. see they see dollar signs Target. in our in our eyes when we come in, right? And so. So I wanted to look around and she and she told me, you know, Annabelle said, well, I'm going to be here for a while. I want to look around. They have a lot of nice stuff. You just go walk around. So I did. So, of course, the first place I walk into is it is it like a place where you can get tailored suits. Right. Because I was curious. And dude, yes. I'm, I'm glad I didn't have much cash on me because I would have <laughs> bought like five suits. No joke. I would have been I would have been wearing a suit every day when I teach from now on. Like, no doubt. Because they just oh had, they had really good fabric, they had really awesome patterns. Like, they had this really cool suit that was like a dark red, almost like a maroon. And it like red is a pretty flashy color if you're going with a suit, but this maroonish like darker red looked really nice, like really classy and elegant. If I and, give you uh, my so measurements, talk, could you bring me back a suit or send me a I could send bring you me back a, suit? a suit? You can even send it to me. That would be hella. That would probably cost as much as it would cost to get the suit oh, tailored really? for you. Okay, yeah. never mind then. Yeah, I can wait. Or, or you could come visit me in China. Yeah, and we see, could go I could. and we could measure you. Yeah, just saying. That's just probably saying. even better. That would be pretty. And then you could haggle for yourself. You could get the full oh, experience. No, no, I, oh. dude, I'm already getting butterflies in my stomach just hearing <laughs> that. <laughs> but anyway, so I talked. I talked to the woman, and I. It, I first told her, you know, I wanted two suits. I wanted like one that's thicker that I could wear in the winter. And I mm-hmm. want one that's like a thinner material for the summer. And she showed mm-hmm. me all sorts for of the great, beach, like, a beach patterns. suit. That's right. A beach suit, a beach suit <laughs> and a snowball fight suit. Those are the suits I want. <laughs> and so, so she showed me a bunch and then, but then I told her the situation. Cause I was like, look, you're going to try to haggle with me and, and like try to get me to buy as many suits as possible. But right now, like today I can't buy any cause I only brought so much cash with me. And so I told her, I told her my situation. I was like, look, I live in Jinan. I don't live in Beijing. I'm here visiting friends. She speaks English? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of them speak pretty well. I would say good enough business English to make some serious deals. For sure. <laughs> the funny thing is, too, though, to though is that a lot of these places, they walk around with calculators and they want you to type in the price you're willing to pay. Because if they hear you, if you say it and someone else hears you say it and it's lower um, than the price that the other people offer, they're going to be like, well... 
this person is I love this, this. For 300 we want, yeah so I love this so anyway so slipping so on gator piss at the at the suit shop I actually got her WeChat tune into our next episode to hear all about WeChat by the way oh go ahead and I, I, I have to, okay go ahead go ahead go ahead go ahead so I got her WeChat and I know where it is so but I kid you not Jared I think when I go back I'll probably get a couple custom tailored shirts it's going to be really hard to not buy four suits because the price she offered me for three suits, for three suits, this is not per suit, but this is for all three of them, was about $270 for three tailor-made yeah, that's amazing. suits. That's amazing. So, yeah. So, I'm going to... But I think there it's the same thing. Like, I asked her, I was like, so if I buy more, will I get a better price? She was like, of course. So... Um, mm. So yeah, your boy might just be suiting up every day to teach after I go there. But the I crazy would, thing was, I would love that. Oh, me too. The the crazy thing was though, is I told her the situation. I said, "Look, I'm an English teacher in Jinan. I don't live in Beijing." And she's like, "Don't worry, suits can be ready for you tomorrow." And I was like, "What? They like, just make them me... in a night?" I guess so. Yeah. Wow. I guess so. But yeah, I gotta do more research on it. But the woman was really nice. Like some some. Wait, of the so you didn't get any. I didn't buy, but I also told her, I said, I don't have enough cash. She's like, it's fine. You know, down payment. But you couldn't, you like, couldn't use WeChat? I didn't have WeChat pay set up at the time. Oh. I didn't have my bank account by then. Uh, yeah. But you, okay, you have so, it now though. Yeah, I have it now and I have WeChat oh, pay. Which gotcha. we'll talk about that the next episode. Hey, speaking of um, WeChat real yeah. quick. Yeah. Um, so I am trying to set up WeChat because yes, our next uh -huh. episode ideally will be about WeChat. And... I have to contact a WeChat user who uh, meets below conditions via phone, SMS, etc. The account was registered mm -hmm. more than six months ago. The account has set up WeChat Pay. Uh, Whose users so yeah, who meet below? Yeah, but I need you to like, vi like vouch for me, essentially. Yeah, yeah. You have to. Well, the, so the we'll talk. We'll talk about it after the after the pod. Um, and I'll, okay. I'll get you set up. Don't worry. I'll get you set up. Um, but yeah. <laughs> You've, yeah. Okay. We, yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyways, but the hey. cra other crazy. Yeah. Go ahead, Go ahead. please. No, please, please, the please. The other please. crazy thing, though, about the silk market that I wanted to mention is, so it's been raining here in Jinan. This is what made me think about it. Or it has rained a few days. And I didn't have a raincoat. So um, I, I was looking at coats. Initially, I wanted to get a leather jacket because... Um, the yes. leather jacket was actually taken in the Czech Republic. So I am leather jacket list for the first time in my life and it feels like 10 years probably. But anyways, I didn't see any leather jackets I liked, but uh, Annabelle wanted to get a, oh, I forget the name of the company now. It's like Mont something. And it's like a French company. Mont they make Blanc. Clothes. Not Mont no. Blanc. No, 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 no. Mont Cla Montclair or something like that. But anyway, so we went into the shop that sold like knockoff coats, right? So, so Annabelle was looking and talked the woman down quite a bit. And so, so I was like, all right, you know what? I haven't really haggled today. I told, I told the woman at the like tailor-made suit shop, I'll be back. Um, but I haven't really haggled today. So I was looking at coats and the, the woman grabbed, grabbed a black North face um, and, and like holds it up to me. She's like, you know, nice coat. And so I look at it and I'm like, all right, what's the best you can offer me? She goes, 900 RMB. Wait, First hold on, all, hold like, on. So she just, she just, she just put a random coat in front of you, and you're just like, "All right, fine. This is what I'll haggle over." Well, no, I looked, I looked at a bunch of different ones, and the the one she handed me looked like the nicest. Um, like it, it was definitely, definitely a good coat. So she offered me nine hundred. Okay, nine hundred RMB. RMB. One hundred twenty-seven U.S. dollars. Okay, nine hundred RMB. I told. First of all, I laughed. She told me that, and I laughed. <laughs> and, and I laughed. <laughs> And I was wow. like, oh, there's no way. And, and, then, and, then I, and then I told her, and then immediately I was like, all right, I'm done playing these games. So I was like, 300. So like a third of what you offered, which I've been told you want to go a third or even lower. So Wait, okay, so that's, like, that's like, 40, like $45, $40. essentially. 40, 40, okay. If you want to be precise, Jared, it's $42.36. Okay, okay. And so, and so, so I told her 300, and she, and she was like, no, too low. And so I was like, and then I was like, all right, well, then that's fine. So I, I go to leave, right? And she, I kid oh, you not, Jared. That's what you're supposed to do. I kid you not, though. I go to leave. She literally grabs me by the arm and says, lowest price, lowest price. And I told her. I was like, 
300 RMB. Like, it's not getting lower. I, sh- I should have been like, you know, I, when mm. she grabbed me, I should have been like, you know what? 150. <laughs> I should have done that. How dare I you didn't. put your hands on me? Exactly. 150. But, but then I was like, I was like 300. And she's like, low. And she kept saying it. And I, I like try to walk out. And she's like, okay, fine, 300. And then so, oh, so I paid. But brilliant. It's, now, I got the jacket. Congratulations. I got the jacket right here. It's, it's not a real North Face, or at least I don't think it is. She also tried to pull the, do you know how expensive a North Face jacket is in, in your country? And I'm like, yeah, but this isn't. Yeah, I know how offensive a North Face jacket is. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's waterproof. The woman even had like a little water bottle. She squirted water on it to show it was waterproof. Wow. It's got like a couple pockets. Got the logo spelled. You can't really see it. Sorry, our YouTube people. It's spelled correctly. Looks mm-hmm. spot on. Um, and yeah, so it was kind of fun though to haggle with her. Yeah, and, uh, but she, and you did a really aggressive. good job too. Yeah, and but she was aggressive, man. Like I was, I was at first I, when she grabbed me, I was like, all right, I'm not buying anything from you, lady. Like if you're gonna be aggressive like this, like um, think about how many but, people. I mean, think about how many uh, rubes she sold that to for like eight hundred. 900 oh, yeah. RMB. And they thought they were getting a good deal too. Like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. This would be 300 in the states. I'm only That paying. seems like I mean we could we could do better than that in the US though. What? We could do better than $127 for a North Face in the US. Where it's how like How much do they cost? I don't know how much they actually cost. I feel like you get one of those for like 80 bucks, 90 bucks. Is that new or used? Used. Who has used coats? I mean, I know people buy all, used coats. All, sor- all sorts of people. I know yeah, people. That was a dumb thing to say. I, I, <laughs> I've my favorite purse from trunk has come from the Salvation Army. Uh, um, no, no, no. But um, oh, also this came from Salvation Army. Um, there you go. No, I, yeah, I don't know how much they cost. I've never owned a North Face, but that seems like a that seems like a not a good deal. I mean, your laughing seems to make sense. All right, right. Chad, give me one spread a little love. Give me one shout out. All right, then if, if I got to give you one, I'm going to give a shout out. Once again, Wisconsin is at it again, Jared. And I want to give a shout out to the governor of Wisconsin. Um, I believe it's Tony Evers or Evers. He has uh, signed an executive order establishing a task force um, to fight against climate crisis. Mm. So there are, so Evers is one of two dozen governors in the Climate Alliance whose members have pledged to reduce their state's heat-trapping pollution uh, by at least 26% um, by 2025. Um, And Wisconsin is also trying to use uh, only carbon-free electricity by 2050, even though it currently gets about half its power from coal. Eliminating Wisconsin's climate footprint would require transformative changes to its electrical, transportation, industrial, and agricultural sectors. But I think this is really amazing. So shout out to Tony Evers of Wisconsin, mm. the government of Wisconsin, for realizing that climate change is a big issue and taking steps to solve it. And there's been a lot of backlash, of course, Jared, uh, because in Wisconsin, I believe it's a Republican majority um, like government. And so there's a lot of people that are very against this. But shout out to you. Uh, I mean, it was Mr. warm Evers. today here in Michigan, so I don't know what they're worried about. <laughs> but... Um, I um, the reason why I said give me one shout out is because I too have a shout out, Chad. NASA's uh, NASA astronauts make history with first all woman spacewalk. Uh, astronauts Christina Co- Koch or Koch, K O C H Cook in German Koch, and Jessica Meyer uh, My- Meyer Meyer M E I R Meyer Meyer maybe. Uh, complete the first spacewalk with an all-woman team. One, gi- oh, okay. One giant leap for womankind. I mean, yeah, that's true. I was just, I, I would have avoided the pun personally if I could have. Two NASA astronauts made space history today uh, as they completed the first ever spacewalk by an all-woman team. The historic uh, extravehicular activity began at 738, uh, which was ahead of schedule as the spacewalk was slated. Okay. Um, so yeah. All right, you don't need to know the gritty details, but it was the first spacewalk that was a uh, all woman team, and um, okay, 
yeah no it's just wow they really got into the nitty-gritty details of this i just thought that was cool you know it's always funny when you hear things like this or it's like wow that's uh that's it but it still is a cool thing to um a- to that that's happening and for those people um it's gonna be great you know they're 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 gonna go down in history that's awesome christina Koch Co- and jessica meyer and or i Coke, think it's great probably. for i think it's great for children to see this for little girls to yes. see that women can be astronauts too and i think that's awesome um yeah sending lots of love to them and also to nasa for um having the the wherewithal to do something like this so i think that's great absolutely i mean yeah well, yeah Jared, sure yeah yeah i think yeah. you might know what time it is oh yes yeah, sir there we go I do know what time it is, Chad. Oh, no, sorry, I meant to keep it going. I thought I could switch fingers so I could... Okay. So, Jared, can I get us started today? Yeah, of course, please. Bye, so my first, Well, both of mine today are Chinese. And my first one is... Which means a crane standing among a flock of chickens. Oh, it's like a, someone that uh, like a sticks out like a sore thumb. Well, Jared, that makes a lot of sense. But is sticking out like a sore thumb is that usually a positive or a negative? A negative. Uh, Translatable. So I would say then in this case that would not be accurate. Oh, so it's like you're like the uh, like the diamond in the rough kind of thing. Ooh, there Maybe. we go. I'll, I'll give Ooh. you that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This expression is used to describe someone who stands out from the rest. So yeah. Okay. Who, you know, yeah. Yeah. So diamond okay. and rough. Yeah. My first untranslatable is Malay and it's Kan Chong spider. And it's, uh, you are a tight, long spider. And the, their word for spider is spider. Listen, that's what the untranslatable says. Okay. It, okay. it could it could have some, maybe there's some English that's mixed, like it's a you know dialectical thing. Could be, could be. Let's see. So what what was it again? Kan Chong spider. You are a tight long spider. You're a tight long spider. Hmm. You're a tight long spider. Is this like you you run a tight ship? Um, kind of, but I want, I think you can do a little bit better than that, but that's very close. That's very close though. Let's just be clear. Like you're, 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 you're 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 organized. You're, I don't know. You're, you're dancing around it. I'll give you, I'll give it, let me give you this hint. When you and I travel together, I always tell you, Hey Chad, come on. You're a tight, long spider. Uh, we have an hour and, uh, we'll get to the airport. Oh, is this just like relax? Is this like relax? Uh, yeah, 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 I guess so. But it means like someone's uptight or anxious. It's not, you know, it's not telling uptight. someone to relax. I see. It's yeah, it's okay. saying like, oh, you're kind of uptight or anxious. Okay, that makes sense. A tight, long spider. Okay. My next one is also Chinese, and it is, one second. San si or ho xing, which means think three times, act after. Uh, oh, um, like think twice before you react, essentially. Yeah. 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 I'll give that one to you. Very good. Okay. My next one is Bengali. And it's Opore Done, uh, Opore Don Pai Hegopod Kai. And it translates literally to if someone else buys you food, you eat with an unclean butt. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? Okay, okay. Um, hmm. Uh, I, I believe this one really got me. I don't even know where to begin with this one. Um, eat with an unclean butt. Because I was thinking at first, like, if somebody buys you food, like, be gracious, and, like, eat all of it. But I don't really know what that has to do with, like, an unclean butt. The, I'll say the, uh, what it is is simple. Like, it's not at, that complicated. Okay. And it has to do with someone else buying you stuff, essentially. Like you don't complain. Don't complain when somebody else buys you something. Mm, no, right? no. It means you're living no. off someone else's money. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. There you go. Well, Jerry, is it time for us to talk about American influence and other countries' spins on American culture? Yeah. Yeah. This was a, a interesting one to think about. Um. Yeah. Why? Why do you think it is? Why do you? Let's just start with why do you think the uh, like like American culture is so popular? Why? I think well. On a half joking, half serious note, I think I think you can you can break it down to one letter in the alphabet that represents three things. I would call it the three M's. We have movies, Hollywood. Mm. We have music. The music industry in the states is very popular around the world. And do you know what the last M is going to stand for, Jared? Um, men. The military. Military. The military. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's kind of how, how we get our influence out around the world is hmm. obviously through a lot of movies, right? I have so many students here in China who have seen, you know, who have seen all the Avengers movies. Right. Who have, you know, who watch American television. They love Tom like Cruise Friends. over there. In China or just in uh, abroad? Uh, abroad. I think he's big in China, abroad, too. Okay. Could be, yeah. But the, uh, I, the, mean, all I, know, the, I know all the Avengers are, too, for sure. Right. Fast right. and Furious. Oh. Mm-hmm. Fast, yeah, Fast and Furious is giant. So, yeah, all these different movies. I think there's a lot of music that's really popular. I mean, probably, probably one of the biggest American... Well, oh, shoot, he's not American. Justin he's Bieber. He's Canadian. He's Canadian. Isn't, is, does he, yeah. he doesn't have American citizenship, does he? I mean, I don't know what his official citizenship is now, but I, he's, a, he's Canadian originally. Right. right. Um, but American music in general, I think, has been huge all over the world for many, many, many years. Um, all, well, let me, let me say this. Maybe, maybe the music has to do more with just being sung in English. And I think a lot of people associate that with the States. Because the other big pop star right now that a lot of people know is Ed Sheeran, who's, who's not American mm. as well. But... The big one that a lot of my students, including a ton of my male students, love is Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift okay. is huge yeah. here in China. Huge. I can imagine that. Um, yeah. Very, very, very big. So um, so music. And then obviously military. We have bases all over the world. Um, but how does that help? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, sadly. How does that, how does that help? help uh, the influence? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it. I think in some ways it helps it, and I think in some ways it damages it. I think it really depends on the relations with that country and what's mm. happening. But for example, like I did not know this, but apparently the U.S. military um, has a very close relationship with um, the military and the police force in Mongolia. Hmm. Um, okay. And they have a good relationship, and but geographically speaking, it makes sense, right? Uh, Mongolia is located literally right in between Russia. In China. Oh, so yeah. So it's in the okay. U.S. best interest, I would say, to have a good relationship with And it's like the most sort of, not neutral, but yeah, neutral, mm-hmm. like in yeah. that area. Right. So, so yeah, but I think the military influence in a lot of ways, obviously when we're waging war with other countries, I'd say that's a negative influence um, mm-hmm. in some ways. I think some people, though, you know, if you're liberating a country from you know, a really evil dictatorship, then that could be viewed differently by some people, but obviously not yeah. by all people. No, but I, I know um, what you mean. Like in certain situations, the American military influence could be looked at as a positive thing. Right, right. Or it's um, like, oh, and, they and helped do, save us or whatever. Right, I and, I, and I do think there, there is some, some good that comes of it. You know, I do think, I do think For sure. there are a lot of military people that are there to help people and, uh, and things like that. But the other thing is, too, is there's this idea of like um, hard diplomacy and soft diplomacy. Hard diplomacy mm. would be like boots on the ground type of diplomacy where, um, yeah. But then soft diplomacy is really kind of what <laughs> I do. Uh, Jared mentioned that, mm. you know, I am uh, in a way an ambassador of the United States. And that, and I would say that's true. I know Jared was he was joking about me making I millions wasn't off joking. of it. Which, which <laughs> Well, Jerry, they must be sending you the paycheck because I haven't been gotten my, <laughs> my millions yet. This podcast but is very expensive to produce. That's true. That is true. It's but a big anyways, operation. The, the deal with soft diplomacy is it's, it's people-to-people diplomacy. It's not like boots-on-the-ground military mm-hmm. diplomacy, but it's people-to-people. It's, you know, for me, it's me meeting teachers here that are from China and working with them and getting to know them. And, and I think soft diplomacy, in a lot of ways, is a great cultural exchange. 
because I exchange my ideas of what is American, you know, American culture, films, music, all sorts of stuff that I love as an American. But then they teach me a lot about China. I've learned a lot about China from my students, from my Chinese colleagues. And, um, and I think if the U.S. wants to have a better influence around the world, we need to prioritize soft diplomacy a lot more. I think we do. We actually, the U.S. spends a lot of money, believe it or not, on soft diplomacy. You just don't hear about it as much because it's not obviously as attention grabbing as the military is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you've said, reasons. and you've said also before that like, um, it's, I assume it's the same in China, but when you were in the Czech Republic, you said that for a lot of your students, this is the first time they've really even interacted with an American for uh, any, any uh, amount of time. And so in a weird way, you are the, the, like you are sort of the, their representation of the United States. And it oh, yeah. is a, a odd little uh, responsibility you have, especially when people are asking you questions or opinions or explanations on American culture, where it's like right. I could, like it, it, theoretically I know how I could spin this many different ways. And I have to try right. to partially give them my opinion, but also not at the same time. Right. <laughs> right. You have to be diplomatic about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, th I really think that a lot of the soft diplomacy that the U.S. government does is really great because mm -hmm. the point of it is to um, make stronger relationships and form, um, you know, stronger connections with other countries around the world, which um, I, I think is very obvious here that we are we are definitely at least I, I won't speak for Jared, but I'm definitely a big supporter of um, our future will be very globalized. It's already globalized in so many different ways already. If you look mm -hmm. at economies around the world, I'm no expert economist, but I mean, it's all very connected. Um, if you look at business, if you look at, if you look at education, I mean, there's a lot of people who go abroad to different countries to, to, you know, for college degrees or for even advanced degrees, like a master's or a PhD. I think it's in all of our best interests around the world to um, embrace each other, embrace our differences, embrace our similarities and, uh, and, and learn together. You know, I think that's a really important thing. And I think the soft diplomacy that the United States does definitely does a good job of that, um, I would say. You know, I don't want to critique the military because I've never been in the military. I don't know everything that the military does. But as someone who has been in two government-affiliated programs over the last two years, I do feel that I can speak more on that. And I think, I think that is really beneficial for all, all parties. You know, there's a lot of mutual benefits there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's really great. And I think that's a good way to show the positive influence and the positives of United States culture around the world. Um, because it's because I think once you get military involved with a lot of things, um, it shuts a lot of people down and, and it intimidates people for good reason. I mean, the United States has a very powerful military. And uh, I think in a lot of ways, we are not to be messed with. Whereas soft diplomacy, it's not really about like the, we are here, we are powerful, but more of, you know, let me share trying things to get about, to know you. Right. Exactly. It's just a different level of, um, relationship building and I guess a way to have some influence. So I think that's really interesting. And the, the other thing about United States influence around the world is I think there are a lot of things in the United States that other countries want to emulate. You know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm tooting the U S's horn quite a bit this episode, uh, which I don't usually do, but I do think there's a lot of great things that come out of the U.S. You know, we have a lot of very successful companies. We have a lot of amazing musicians and actors. And, uh, and so I think there's a lot of things that other countries want to emulate. Sadly, mm -hmm. though, another thing that I think a lot of countries emulate or want to emulate, and this is really where they put their own spin on it, is U.S. cuisine, especially fast food. We've yeah. done an episode about fast food in different countries. Yes. I mean, um, we could do those all the time because it's always changing. Yeah. It is. And especially, I tell you what. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, go ahead. I was going to say, especially as, um, you b being in China where uh, KFC is big business, I'd be, interested to know what, what, business. What, I'd be interested to know what they have going on on their menus over well, did there. I, tell you, I told you about what happened that one time at KFC, right? Um, I think you did. Yeah, so what happened? Just, I'll, 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 a quick recap. So I went there, and uh, and they had like a deal where you got this like bucket of <coughs> this bucket of all sorts of different stuff. So it had like two two like wings, like you know, like 
battered and fried, like traditional, like kind of what you would see in the States, chicken wings. Then they had two, uh, two wings that like weren't fried. They were probably like cooked in an oven. Then there were what I thought was popcorn chicken and then uh, fries and then chicken nuggets. And the chicken nuggets I saw, they had like some like yellow stuff in the middle. So I was like, oh, like cheese filled chicken nuggets. Oh, That'd be interesting. yeah. Cool. Jared knows mm-hmm. where I'm going with this. Well, it turns out that the chicken nuggets were not cheese filled. They were durian filled. Durian is like this really smelly fruit that's super popular here in Asia. Um, I think they might also call it jackfruit, but I could be wrong. But anyways, I have never smelled a funkier smelling chicken nugget in my entire life. Um, <laughs> well, it's also not a chicken it. nugget, to be fair. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but now, though, Jared, the cool thing is KFC now. I was so bummed because I'm so used to like in the Czech Republic, once in a while I'd get KFC and I could get mm-hmm. like a bucket of wings right and here like none of their buckets were like of wings they'd have like two chicken wings and i'm like i'm like come on guys i'm american yeah, no, give that's... me my damn chicken wings uh, who, who, wait, you get a, who does that you're <laughs> supposed to do them in like measurements of like five right Ex- exactly well i went into kfc last week uh to have my my chicken wings and they finally have buckets now mm. the buckets have a couple different assortments so they have a couple, I don't know how many, I didn't read the thing, but I just saw that it was a bucket and there was a picture of a bunch of chicken wings. So I'm going to have to go back there and find wow. out, do some, All right. do some intel. Let's talk about uh, things, uh, Amer- parts of American, co- American pop culture that are popular in other parts of the world. Okay, let's do it. I'll quiz you on this first one. Um, okay. do you, can you think of an American beer that's very popular in china that would kind of surprise um, your average american like surprise? me for example surprise well i would i mean budweiser is it's very pop that's not the one i was thinking of but is well, it very popular very there pop, i don't know if it's very popular but i've seen it at places well it's, the funny thing is it's expensive let's put it this way okay that's what i was to say this beer is considered sort of a crappy beer in america but it's a luxury beer in china paps blue ribbon Yes, very good. Parada. PBR is... Um, uh, wait. It's a luxury beer that costs $44 a bottle. Its packaging is often more elegant, and advertisements compare it to scotch, brandy, and Bordeaux wine. While the Chinese version is brewed slightly differently than the American PBR, it's still a $44 bottle of wine, obviously. Have you heard of bottle the movie... Of wine? Uh, beer, excuse me. Have oh. you heard of the movie Baby's Day Out? I have not, no. Yeah, me neither. Baby's Day Out <laughs> was released in 1994. Um, Americans weren't impressed with the 21% rating on Rotten Tomer- uh, Tomatoes. The film about the adventures of the wealthy Baby Bink just didn't capture the American imagination. The same can't be said in South Asia, where the film is the most po- is more popular than Star Wars, uh, according to Roger Ebert's heuristic experience. In India, uh, Baby's Day Out is so beloved that it has been remade twice. First in 1995 under the name Sisindri, then again in 1999 with the title James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that geez, seems that's funny. Like a uh, okay. Seems a the original film has right. uh, also been dubbed in Tamil, Punjabi, and Bengali. A movie us Americans have never even heard of. Um, right. Oh, that's funny. Donald Duck. See, and that's is, what I mean. Sorry, Jay. That's ahead. what I mean, though. When when like American culture in different places is so interesting because. Mm-hmm. Because other countries, they have a very different opinion of what American culture means to them. Yes. And so it's always interesting what they latch on to, right? Like, well, like, yeah. It, so I, I was going to say, it's funny that you say that because I'll actually get to a list of uh, like things in different languages, like American something something and what it is. Oh, Donald cool. Dunk okay. is integral to Swedish Christmas. Uh, in America, Donald Duck is an easily recognizable, slightly hokey disney character in sweden however the pantless duck holds considerably more clout one of sweden's cherished holiday traditions involves watching a disney christmas special called from all of us to all of you known as in swedish as kale anka oka ok uh, kale anka ok 
Hans Banner on Scar Gold Jewel. Donald Dunk and his uh, friends wish you a Merry Christmas. Or Kalyanka for short. Uh, the program, which has been uh, airing since 1959, shows Jiminy Cricket presenting a series of old Disney shorts with several uh, portions involving a life host. So yeah, Donald Duck is Donald Duck is a big deal in Sweden. Elf, okay. you know where Elf is very popular. I think you know the answer to this. Elf, yeah, like the movie with Will, Will Ferrell. The character Elf, you know the the, the character. character. Elf. Do you mean Alf? Alf, excuse me. Alf. Okay, I was hearing Elf, not Alf. Okay. Yeah, I know, that's my what bad. Is Alf, is, is Alf big in, in Asia? Elf is big in Germany. Really? Elf is a German pop that. star. Okay. While you might know that American actor David Hasselhoff is a, a sensation in Germany, you might not have heard that Alf, the 1980s alien puppet living in suburb, suburbia, is at uh, the very least equally popular. Elf was originally a sitcom character, but over in Germany, he's taken on a whole new life as a pop star. In Germany, Elf was voiced by Tommy <laughs> Piper, a singer slash actor who also helped dub Oscar the Grouch in Sulu of Star Trek between 1988 and 1991. Piper released two full length albums and four singles as Elf. The songs included a love ballad called Rhonda and a rap entitled Elf wird unser Bundeskanzler, <laughs> which is <laughs> Elf will be our, uh, our chancellor. <laughs> known, in en- known in English as uh, Elf will be our... Oh, it says it right there. As Elf, Elf will be our chancellor, uh, Rhonda stayed on the charts for 12 weeks. Desperate Housewives... Desperate Housewives is North Korea's portal to American suburbia. Wow. North Korea is Desperate in, Housewives. North Korea isn't known for its enjoyment of American anything. Rather, they are known for thinking that America is the epitome of evil and that the country should be wiped off the map. I mean, Desperate Housewives kind of proves their... Uh, apparently, that doesn't mean... <laughs> yeah, that maybe that's why it's North popular. Cor- that some North Korean citizens don't enjoy American pop culture. On the contrary, they're particularly fond of Desperate Housewives and Sex in the City. The popular show is actually entirely uh, international. Kang Chol Hwan, the famous, well, excuse me, the force behind the North Korea Strategy Center, is one of several groups who smuggle American media into North Korea, he told Wired. How does that work, that he's just telling people? Anyway, Desperate Housewives right. and um, uh, what was the other one I just said? And um, uh, Desperate Elf. Housewives. No, 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 no. And Sex in the City. Oh. Oh, my um, gosh. That's, I also wonder, though, too, what... Like, you, you know they censor stuff and they, like, change stuff. So I wonder what an episode of Desperate Housewives looks like in North Korea. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, there's weird cuts or something. <laughs> right. Right. Also... You'll love this. This is my last one of these. Simpsons. Uh, excuse me. Spain has two restaurants based on The Simpsons. Oh, in that's America, awesome. The Simpsons has its hate, had, had its heyday in the 90s. Most millennials, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, in Spain, you can visit not one, but two Simpsons-themed restaurants. There's Homer's Home, a donut shop with character-themed creations. Uh, additionally, Krasty Burger is a copyright skirting fast food joint that's decorated with simpsons paraphernalia crusty Sp- burger oh wow that's funny um and they also spanish soccer fans once themed a simpsons themed uh once uh did a stage at Simpson, a simpsons themed protest in response to unfavorable kickoff times complete with full body costumes and signs displaying memorable quotes there you go oh that's cool that's really funny mm-hmm. that's really cool yeah yeah, and it's it's interesting too though because other countries that get all these different types of American media, it's always changed in a way. Whether, you know, one you have to wonder how good the translations are. Yes. You know? Then you also wonder what's been cut and what's and and I've heard in some countries they even add different scenes as well. Um so it's it's really interesting uh, and I think that also changes other countries' perceptives on American culture. 
I think that also speaks to like how, you know, when you explain to me American quote unquote things that you've experienced in your times abroad, how like, to me, it seems like how are they getting like what seems to be the simplest part of the meal wrong? Like we don't right. put corn on pizza. What makes you guys think we do that? Just for right. an example that comes off the top right. of my head. But it's just like, it's like it's 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 so interesting how you guys slightly change uh, or or even adapt it just for like marketing purposes where it's like we're going to market it as, as American, but we still need to slightly make it how uh, like change how it's made to really fit right. what people want. Like mm -hmm. people want like want to think that they're getting something American. Maybe they don't necessarily want what the Americans actually eat, you know? Right. Right. Because we I'll eat a lot of shit here. <laughs> We do. We eat way too you much. You guys aren't ready for this. You guys can't handle this life. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, the funny thing is, though, too, Jared, is that I would say the most American place that I've been so far in China, at least in terms of accuracy of the menu, is not KFC, is not mm. McDonald's, although both of them do a decent job. Also not Burger King. Burger King in China also, in my opinion, is not very good. But anyways. Well, that's similar to the U.S., Dairy, dairy queen. queen. I have a Dairy Queen near my apartment. and Do they, they have serve food flavors. there too? They do. I haven't had the food, but okay, I've had I the ice cream. Do they call them the same thing, like a blizzard? Call them blizzards. Yep, they do call them oh, blizzards. okay. Now, they okay. do have some Chinese-style flavors, though. Like, they have, like, a green tea flavor. Mm. They have, like, a jasmine and something flavor. Right. Um, but they also, they also have the big... They have like Oreo. I usually get the Oreo one. They have the strawberry cheesecake flavor. So they mm -hmm. do have a lot of the flavors we do have in the States as well. Right. Um, but yeah, and a lot of it, yeah, has to just do with like money. You know, a lot of it has to do with, well, we want to sell this American thing, but maybe the taste buds of the people in this country, are, our consumers, are not going to enjoy, you know, like American stuff to me now, especially since I've been abroad for a while. American, a lot of American stuff for me is just too sweet. Like we put too much sugar hmm. in everything. And so uh, yeah, and I've okay. had other people, I've had other people who aren't Americans tell me when they go to America, like it blows their mind just how much sweet stuff we have. Like even, even our bread at the grocery store has sugar in it. Like if you look. Yeah. Oh um, yeah, for sure. Let's uh, just a yeah. loaf of bread. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I thought most bread had sugar in it. Am, am I wrong? I don't think think so but i i could also be wrong i'm not a not a pastry chef okay right? i'm gonna give you yeah. uh 13 items labeled american and other countries okay cool uh cinta americana american tape in spain uh duct tape is called american tape good i'm happy with that yes I'm happy with that yes it fixes everything people duct tape fixes everything poing american uh, American fist, point maybe Ameri American, in French. Um, what are what are American fists? In uh, what do you just take a guess? What do you think those are? American fist. It's a weapon. I mean, I, oh, brass knuckles. Wow, yeah, brass knuckles. Yeah, very okay. good. Alface americana, uh, Brazilian. That's Italian. Oh, Brazilian. Brazilian Portuguese. Okay. Uh, has the term alface. Americana or American lettuce. Which lettuce is the American lettuce? Iceberg. Very good. <laughs> yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> We're cheapskates, everyone. That's uh, right. Ameri uh, Americansky Gorky. In Russian, the, uh, Amer uh, it's American mountains. What do you think is American mountains? American mountains? It's a machine machine okay american mountains i have no idea what is it um roller coaster oh that's a good one i and like that one in most of the romance languages they're known as russian mountains really mm -hmm. interesting okay uh um Amerishki solata the Sol slovenians uh call Something American salad. Americans, American salad. Think about think what American. Just, go ahead. Sorry. I would think that would just be like a like a house salad. 
No, 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 no. This is no. very specific. It comes with usually a, maybe some sort of lunch sandwich or something. Probably, potentially could oh. involve a lot of mayonnaise. Oh. Yeah. Um, coleslaw. No, coleslaw? There you go. Yep, there you coleslaw. go. Coleslaw, okay. Parada. Okay. Um, qua pad American. American fried rice. The uh, served in Thailand rare, uh, is rarely found in American Thai restaurants. Um, the rice is fried with ketchup or tomato Ooh, sauce gross. and might be mixed with raisins and peas. What the heck? What are you people doing? It's served doing? with <laughs> some combination of fried chicken, bacon, hot dogs, ham, and croutons. Apparently, it was created during the Vietnam War, which many Americans were, uh, when many Americans were stationed in Thailand and the dish went on to become a Thai comfort food. Uh, what, Americ- what? Oh, man. Oh, so yeah, no, it's but continue, the, continue, the raisins continue. is a huge. I mean, even if the I don't need the, the even if you just take out the raisins, that would really improve it. Right. Um, and I like raisins, too, but not in that combination. Not with ketchup and bacon and hot and dogs. Chicken and chicken. Yeah. <laughs> and croutons. Right. right. Uh, Americans stock. American, American stock. In Belgium, um, there's something that's specifically called American stock in stores. American stock. I, I don't even know. What is it? Uh, stores that carry things like camping or hunting equipment, tools, boots, military surplus, sporting goods stores are often called Americanza stock. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I feel like we. I feel like there are there, definitely a lot of outdoorsy people in the states, and that actually kind of um, validates what she said earlier about um, the military being a huge part of our culture. Right. It is. Uh, Volna Americanka, um, or Free American, uh, is a Polish phrase. Free American. Yes. Oh, it's a phrase. So is this like when you're just like free as a bird? No, 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 no. It's actually a... <laughs> no, sorry. It's not a phrase. It's a sport. It's a f- is it f- American football? No, no, no. It's uh, no restrictions wrestling. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, that's funny. It's a style of catches catch can, no restrictions wrestling in Poland. The phrase has the more general sense of all bets are off or anything okay. goes. Anything so goes. I guess that's okay. another big part of the American culture is just freedom, where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah you want to be free, go at it. <laughs> right. No kidding. Uh, I'll give you um, uh, one more, two more maybe. These are good. I like these. Americansa Fuif, American Party, is it Dutch? Uh, it's, it's Dutch. House excuse party. me. House no, party no, no, with no. red solo cups. No. <laughs> uh, but it's also a. Um, also in Brazil, they call it uh, Festa Americana. And it's usually something that's done at uh, maybe an office party. Okay. Uh, around like a, Christmas, like, especially if your company doesn't have a lot of money to spend on. Oh, like a Chris- There it's you potluck. go. There you go. Yeah. And yeah. For our listeners out there that don't know what a potluck is, a potluck is when everyone brings a dish to share. I hate potlucks. I don't trust people like that. I was telling my students last week, though, where potluck was. What are the, um, how do they feel about it? Um, I think in China, it's a very common thing anyway. Oh, that's like true. You share, you share so much food here. Yeah. And I love it, man. Like, you get to try so much. I think the reason, though, why we don't do this as much in America, at least when you, especially if you go to dinner, is it's too expensive. You know, in China, like I said, I went out with Annabelle and her crewmates. So there were 11 of us at a table. And we each paid $20 per person and everybody ate their fill. I had like three beers, mm. had all sorts of different food and paid $20. In the States, one beer and one meal is going to cost you at least 20 bucks, depending on For where sure. you go. Yeah, yeah, that happened to me the other day. Mm-hmm. I have one more um, American, uh, like American phrase in Dutch. Okay. And I think this, is, this also is a big um, sort of a, a sign of American culture. And it's uh, Americansa Tustanden. Tust, tust tust Americansa Tustanden. Which means? And it's American Conditions. Oh, American Conditions. Is this... I don't even know where to begin with this one. Let me, tell me where it is, Jared. The Dutch have an easy phrase to pull out when talking about huge gaps between rich and poor, lack of health care, wow. or educational okay. 
access okay. school shootings or a range of other situations, including probably cans of beer labeled America. American conditions are something to be warned against as in let's be careful with this decision and not get ourselves in a bad case of American conditions. Oh, that hurts a little bit. I mean, it's true. <laughs> yeah, it's lower rough. A lot of that's true, but that hurts. It's lower rough. That hurts. It's lower, it's Come, on, painful. Come on, Netherlands. Come on. There it is. There it is. <laughs> like, easy, yeah. easy. Let's not, let's not turn into Americans, right. essentially, is what they're saying. Basically, Which I get yeah. it, but it, it, it does hurt it a hurts. little bit. I agree. Yeah. We're coming at you, Dutch people. Be ready. No, no, no. We're not. No, we're not. No, we're we're not. not. Hey, we, Chad, don't get, don't get caught up in American conditions. <laughs> That's right, Jared. That's true. Plus, I really like the Netherlands and Dutch people anyways. Me too. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Those, yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, I think a lot of I think a lot of these views on what is American can be boiled down to like a couple different things, like the media and like products that mm-hmm. these countries get and also like from America. Uh, I think that's one big thing. Another one is the country's history with America. Has it been a uh, happy and prosperous relationship has it been a strained and very negative one due to mm. military conflict yes. or due to differences in government i think that's a big thing i will say this though my impression of people here in china is that um i think chinese people are very curious about american culture and i think they really like americans but i think on a governmental level there's still a lot of there's a lot of conflict or a lot of strain just because the U.S. government and Chinese government, they're very different systems with very different philosophies and ideologies. Mm. But I think it just goes to show you that anywhere in the world you can travel to where I think on a people-to-people level, um, I would say that we all can relate, right? Like oh, Americans, for sure. On a people-to-people level, it's really once you blow things up into like an ideological standpoint of like, well, I believe in this type of government, I believe in this type of religion, I believe in whatever, that's when things can get a little bit more strained. But I do think that a lot of the entertainment that comes from America does portray the U.S. and gives us a good reputation for the most part. Yeah, and I, yeah, it's also like... um. It is like an exaggerated view, you know, like it is mm-hmm. sort of like um, the, the gla- like the, the, the stuff that mostly is popular is sort of the glamorized aspects of it. And it's like the stuff you hear, like, the, you know, those cars or those clothes or whatever that you hear consistently in uh, mm-hmm. the culture. But it's also kind of the same thing, like how, you know, maybe over here in the U.S., something that is European, whether it be German, you know, you know, whether it's a car that's German or like food that's French or Italian or something is considered to be right. very fancy where it's like um, it's just th- that whole sort of like the the unknown is 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 either scary or you think it's like, ooh wow, they what they like or you uh, look up to it, you know, and sort of uh, idealize what's just normal culture for other people. Right. Speaking of yeah. culture that we love to idealize here on the Untranslatable podcast, that's uh, songs. Oh, and yeah. uh, that's a great example of how culture spreads around the world. Um, but we try our hardest not to focus on American songs. But I think this song does, uh, have, uh, does talk about a theme that is very fitting to America. Has a ton of different undertones that can for sure be applied to the American context. The song is called mm-hmm. Slave Mill by Damien Marley. Right, Damien Marley? Yeah, Damien yeah. Marley Jr. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic song. The lyrics are definitely very deep, I think. Uh, the reason why I like a lot of music by him is there's a lot of social... Um, issues that he talks about. And this song is definitely no different. Um, what I liked yeah, about this song mm-hmm. is that, um, like, it is, it is quote-unquote deep, but also, like, it's, it's, it's something that even just, like, your average sort of, like, like, you can also think about it and not, like, have an ex- existential crisis about, like, about, like, life. And also, maybe you just think about it and be like, hey, maybe I try a little bit harder to disconnect from work when i'm on vacation or something like that like it also right. can, can have that sort of because I, I agree with you and i like it, it can be very like intense maybe but i think you can also just be like how do i approach like what's important to me in life it also is what it makes right. me think about what do i sure. prioritize how do right. i spend and, my time 
Absolutely. Well, and I think that's the the key with with the song is that um, you know the the slave mill has it still exists. It's just changed its conditions over time. You know, it used mm-hmm. to be um, like a legitimate enslavement of people. Now right. it's still happening, but we we become slaves to our jobs. We become slaves to police. Technology might even lose our lives. Technology, exactly. And and I think I think in a lot of ways it's very true. You know, I know so many people who are miserable um, in their nine to fives, mm-hmm. and and they feel like you know they're they're just trapped. They have no way out. Um, and some people assume that like, oh, um, I I yeah. It's also the the struggle of a lot of people who are hate their their nine to fives, but also make a living. You know. And it's just mm-hmm. like, well, this is just like I'm I'm stuck into this because I, I'm I don't know what else to do, and I make a good living. Like it's I'm supporting myself, and I have all these bills I have to pay. So it's like you just kind of like, well, this is what I'm gonna. People just kind of either feel like, oh, work's not my the place where I'm either supposed to enjoy myself or I can't leave because I need this paycheck. Right. And either way, it right. is sort of you you kind of trapped in the you're just trapped. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's a fantastic song. I think very socially conscious. Um, in terms of the music, it's it's. I'm trying to think of other words and just like positive um, adjectives here. But I I really like the song. It has a lot of elements where it's. I would say would you would you classify it as reggae, Jared? How would you classify probably. it? Probably. Yeah, I probably yeah. would. But I don't think it's as upbeat. As a lot yeah, of it's not tunes. it's not as like it's not heavy handed reggae. Right. I don't think. Right, like I don't feel like I should be like sitting on a beach, like sipping like, like no, a rum no cocktail. Like this. Well, is it's like called a, slave mill, so um. Right, it, sh- it shouldn't <laughs> give you that feeling. That's true. It's very true. But yeah, it's a fantastic song. Very good yes. choice, Jared. Check it Thank out you. on our YouTube channel, Untranslatable Podcast. I mean, uh, Slave Mill by Damian Marley Jr. Yeah. I figured you're a fan. You, you've heard of him. I, you are oh, you a yeah. fan of him? Do you like listen to his stuff? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff by him. Can you the hit me with your Chinese words? Po- oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, the, well, the funny thing is, there's a lot of artists that I forget that are like international artists, like that I right. listen to often. And this is one of them where I'm like, oh my gosh, like why didn't I pick a David Marley? Jr. I song probably have sooner. a bunch of those too. Right. Right, we just but it's just like playlists and stuff. It's like I don't listen to them right now, but I used to love these right. people, and I just never like when I listened right. to it, I never, I never even thought about the fact that they were uh, not American. Right. So my American, uh, my American, my Chinese word of the pot today <laughs> is uh, Meiguo, and Meiguo means America. Okay, interesting. Mm-hmm. Meiguo. How and do you say so China you know, in China, in Chinese? So, so, so China is um, Zhang Guo, and Chinese oh. person would be Zhang Guo Ren, and American person would be Mai Guo Ren. It literally means oh. American person, or American person, China person. Uh huh. So you can, probably, you can do that with it. like every nationality Ren, similar? Ying Guo Ren would be an English person, or England, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you can do that for just about every nationality. I, I okay. think so. Okay. My Spanish word is more of a phrase well it's a phrase in spanish but it's a word in um english okay in any cuidor de una mora iniquiadora actually oh iniquiadora de una mora which means united states no that doesn't mean pionero we could all you could also say oh pioneer or Give Someone else that's a pioneer might be at the forefront of um, setting trends, a trendsetter. Trendsetter. Oh, mm. okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do think the U.S. is a trendsetter in a lot of different ways. Although I think a lot of the fashion comes from Europe. I will say that. <laughs> but that's just my opinion. My humble Bless opinion. Bless you. Okay. But yeah, the U.S. is definitely trendsetters, though, uh, especially when it comes to music and movies, without a doubt. All right, Jared, it's time for a couple jokes. I love U.S. jokes, so here we go. So, Jared, what is the only time when the colors red, white, and blue do not represent freedom? Uh, oh, I know, when you're getting pulled over. Yes, sir. Very good. <laughs> yeah. You see those colors in the rearview mirror. That's right. Um, yes. That's a good one, state, though. That's, that is a good joke. Right. Which state in the United States um, is high in the middle and round at both ends? 
high in the middle and, and around, around at both ends. Um, Colorado. Ohio. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I was thinking like high because uh, Colorado has legal mer- weed. <laughs> and they also have mountains, but yeah. Um, yeah. Good. What state Oh, that's has a good the, point too. That probably is better. Right. What state has the most lead in the United States? Or uh, Texas. Graphite. Or oh. graphite now. because they. What's that? Lead. Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> real giants oh, right classic, there right that was that's like a that's like a good family friendly joke or like a joke i could tell yeah. my students right there um and don't want to yeah. scare them with a getting pulled over joke but do, that's for sure. do you want them to laugh though then maybe do, i shouldn't say that one huh <laughs> do you think they would laugh at that they might i mean they are your students so they're they trying might. to get it great they have to that's right yeah that's they know right. how to they know how to play the game right um yeah so there you go a couple jokes some american jokes for you all thank you chad so yeah so i think to recap our episode though um one it's just fascinating the different spins on american culture around the world like donald duck related to christmas in sweden um, yes american conditions in the netherlands where it's like don't be doing that you might be slipping on gator there we go there we go (laughs) sorry Um, i was uh you're good you were preoccupied um, let's see here. Some other countries. I mean, I think fast food is the very easy, like American thing that a lot of countries like look at. I've been asked in right. almost every country I've been to, like, do Americans eat McDonald's every day? And it's like, well, there might be some, but most Americans definitely don't eat fast food every day. I um, live, but I, by the way, I, the way where I turn into my, onto my street, there's a McDonald's right on the corner. And every time I turn into my street, there's always someone turning into McDonald's and Wendy's. That's right next to it, for that yep. matter. Yep. It's hard to resist. There's so many fast food places in the States. Yeah. If you're hungry and you're driving, it's like... Honestly, I'd go to the Wendy's more, but they're just so slow. That, that's, oh, really? That l- luckily, I guess, th- thank you for being so right. slow. <laughs> right. Right. But other than fast food, I think um, music, movies, and sitcoms and TV series are, are very big. And uh, we can thank them for hopefully mm-hmm. portraying America in a positive light. Um, the but United they don't. States, well, not, yeah, not all of them do. And I've been asked by students, like, do Americans really live like, like you see in the movies? And it's like, of course not. Like, of course that's a what does that even mean? romanticized. <laughs> I, think, I think they mean, like, do all Americans have, like, you know, like a big house and, like, two kids and a dog and a minivan and, and like, all that mm. stuff, um, which is definitely not the case, especially for a lot of us millennials. That's for sure. But yeah, no, no we hope you've enjoyed hearing the American spin on different things and why there is such a you big betcha. American influence. Whether that be positive or negative, that can be for you to decide. Um, I'm definitely too biased as an American to even give my opinion on that anyways. But we hope you've enjoyed this episode. You've learned some new things about American influence abroad and what other countries think is American. Uh, let us know at untranslatablepodcast at gmail.com what American culture or the United States means to you. We'd love to hear from you. Check out our Instagram, Untranslatable Podcast, for all sorts of pics of our adventures, some clips, and other great things related to the podcast. Yeah. Also, check out our website, untranslatablepodcast.com, if you want to get access to our episodes or want to see some untranslatables. There's a lot of cool stuff there as well. And lastly, please, five-star reviews on iTunes and Stitcher. Spread and a little love. Know how we can make this podcast better for you. If there's any topics you'd like us to cover, any untranslatables you'd like to send us, that would be greatly appreciated. We'd love to hear from you. So, as we say here at the Untranslatable Podcast, de cuyame, muchas gracias, and shish shish.